You're now listening to the Art of Reinvention Show, hosted by your boy Teflon John. Where my goal is to change the world one person at a time by provoking thought. And you're now in the right place to receive motivation, inspiration, so you can make it throughout your day, so you can make it throughout your week. And so, like I said, I just want you guys to sit back and just absorb all the content. And as I always say, one love, be blessed. Hey, it's your boy Teflon John, the host of the Art of Reinvention Podcast Show. And this episode of the Art of Reinvention Podcast Show is called The Stigma of Mental Illness. And this is a two-part series, so make sure you stay tuned for next week where we drop the second episode. And in this episode, I'm also introducing uh, my new co-host, Alexis D. Monet. So sit back and absorb all the content. One love. Be blessed. Hey, what's going on? I wrote something for y'all. Check it out for me, please. It means a lot. I wake up every day and I just want to be happy. But my brain does not cooperate. It's honestly tragic. Living with depression ain't what most people think. I try so many up for them hard, but I'm still on the brink. Things can seem perfect, but in my head nothing's working. I think that I need a surgeon to cut me open. Observe it, please tell me what is wrong with me. Cause I don't understand. Used to hide these problems behind drugs. Now I'm a different man. Stop drinking and dropping them. Diagnosing my problems. Now I know the issue, but no idea how to stop them. It's the craziest thing. Cause I can see it when it happens. But I can't stop these feelings from racing in and then crashing. And I can feel the collision all the way down in my stomach. Like I got punched in the gut. And there ain't no running from it. I could be up at the sun. One thing happened, I plummet They tell me take my meds and calm down But I don't like feeling nothing Now let me tell y'all folks something I've been like this my whole life Been trying to hide it and fight it And shit didn't go right My methods of coping was just me drinking and smoking Anything I could take, I'd pop it in and keep going But that was just me not knowing that I was making it worse If I had stayed on that path, I'd probably be in the hearse Hey, what's going on everybody? It's your boy Teflon John Coming to you with my co-host for the day my co-host, my sister-in-law, is really coming on hard, Alexis D. Monet. So I'm going to let her introduce herself to you guys and tell, you know, her background and all that good stuff. So hi, you guys. I'm Alexis D. Monet. Um, just coming out to share some of my thoughts, um, give a little bit of my background. I, I have a bachelor's in human services. Um, I have a degree in criminal justice, and I work in the mental health field currently. Um Okay, so now when it comes to that that freestyle that we heard, you were introduced to that on what Facebook or YouTube? I watched it on Facebook. Facebook. So, so do you think that's a great depiction of 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 what they go through? People that, that have that problem. Um. Yeah, it gives good insight on what people go through on a day to day basis, and that's what I deal with on a regular basis, dealing with the clients that I do see. Um, a lot of them suffer from depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. I mean, it's a number of mental illnesses and it's a stigma attached to admitting that you have a mental illness. Gotcha. So this episode for everyone is called the stigma of, of mental illness. And why, and why do we call it that? Why does mental illness have a stigma? Because people are fearful of admitting that they have a mental health diagnosis because they're labeled as crazy, um, psychotic, any name that you could think of is labeled with the mental health diagnosis is attached to it. It's a stigma to it. People think that they're going to hurt you because they're crazy or whatever the case may be when they have a mental illness. So they just have a fear of coming out to actually get help. Yes. They fear how people will view them if they admit that they do have that illness. So do you think a lot of things that we see on the news can contribute to mental illness not being diagnosed properly, not being treated properly, or not even being sought after, like, treatment? The treatment. I think the ones that are seeking help for their mental illness are not the ones that you have to worry about. It's the ones that's actually not receiving any treatment those are the ones that you should fear because if you mm. reach out for help mm -hmm. and you're getting the medications, the treatment that you need, that's the ones that are not ones to worry about. The ones that aren't getting treatment that are self-medicating drugs, alcohol, mm -hmm. um, trying to cope with their symptoms are the ones that could act out. So, so why would one not want to get treated outside of the whole Stigma, is it coming from their peers, their family, or, or is it just a society thing? It's a society thing. It's the label of being, having a mental illness. 
All right, so what do you think is uh, somewhere where we should start? Because I'll, I'll let you drive it since this is your background. So where should we start as far as tackling this? Because I think, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you see the Jesse Smollett. A lot of people are saying that that could be contributed to some type of, me- of mental illness. Now, what do you think about, just before we get into your topics, people that misuse that label to, to try to get out of something? You know what I'm saying? Whether it be, like, a legal type of situation, whether it be, like, um, you know, jail time. Like, what do you think about that? Like, how does that hurt people that really have a mental illness? I think it makes it worse for people to actually come out and say that they have a mental illness just because someone who could kill somebody, they did that and said, oh, well, I wasn't in my right state of mind. I mean, you could actually snap and not be in your right state of mind, but that doesn't mean you have a mental health diagnosis. I mean, you were in rage or, I mean, say, for instance, you're in a fight. You get angry, your adrenaline's pumping, you're not in your right state of mind at that time, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a mental health issue. That just means you blacked out during that time. So, yeah. So you can't really say that it was a mental illness that caused you to do it. Now, you weren't in your right state of mind, but you're not really diagnosed with a mental illness. Yeah, but it reminds me of like someone crying rape, you know what I'm saying, that has been raped, has been sexually abused, but then there's this one person that they do the court case or whatever, and they find that they actually lied just to get money. I think that hurts the credibility of everyone else that comes behind them. And I think when it, you know, when it comes to mental illness, especially in the African-American community, which that's something that we'll um, tackle later, but some people can see the signs, but they don't want to accept because of pride, like my child or my mother or my cousin or whoever has a problem. You know what I'm saying? So a little bit about why this means so much to me. Um, I went through a depression state. I cried every day. Couldn't tell you what was going on, why I was crying. Um, And I didn't want to seek help because I came from a strong black family, independent women. Mm -hmm. um, And that was a sign of weakness for me. So I didn't seek help for a while. And everybody kept saying, you know, you're depressed, you're this, you're that. And I'm like, no, I mean, you know, I'm too strong for Mm -hmm. that. Like, I'm not going to admit that I'm, I have a diagnosis of depression. Yeah. So I didn't seek help. The only thing that pushed me to seek help was my kids. When I started lashing out at them, they irritated me. I had no patience. They were young. I was frustrated all the time Mm -hmm. and I couldn't really tell you what I was crying about at any given time, I would just cry at the drop of a hat um, just for no reason. And my kids motivated me to seek help because I was taking it out on the wrong people. But were you trying to figure that out or was it just that moment of clarity where you figure like something's not right? So, like they must be right about something. I felt like it was something wrong, but just admitting that I was, yeah. I had a label of yeah. Yeah. A depression that was the toughest part for me to overcome. But did it bother you when you noticed you were different? Like, like they're like they're telling you this, and you're denying it. But you can start saying, "Yeah, there is a difference." Well, nobody. I mean, they, people were mentioning it just by my actions. They could see that something was wrong with me. But just because of my pride, I wouldn't allow myself to admit that there was an issue. I was just saying, you know, I'm just having a bad day kind of thing. Or, you know, I would kind of brush it under the rug. I'm not, I'm not myself today, but I'm not really depressed. Like everybody cry, you know, something going on, you cry and you watching a movie, you crying, but that don't mean you depressed. So don't say I'm depressed just because I'm sitting up here crying and I can't tell you what I'm crying about. That was what I, I mean, I just brushed it under the rug. I didn't want to say that I got a problem, which I did. But do you think that's like, that could be the start of most people's issue? I think that is the, that's why people don't seek help because they feel like they're going to be labeled as weak. That was my biggest thing. I felt like if me admitting that I had depression was me saying that I was weak and I felt like I was too strong for that. I was too prideful for that and I didn't want to do anything about it so do you think admitting something was wrong was like that was like okay now i'm losing this battle because you obviously knew something was wrong yeah i 
admitting and trying to seek help was, I felt like looking back on it now, I say the strongest person is someone who actually reach out for help. Weak people are the ones that don't seek help and try to self-medicate um, using drugs or whatever to cope with their feelings. Mm-hmm. But it really takes a strong person with some courage to say, I have a problem. I'm going to get the help that I need because this is not normal. That is a strong person. And now I look at myself and I take pride in me admitting that I had a problem seeking mm-hmm. help. And now, I mean, you know, I have, they had me on medications for a short period of time. They said, you're going to take it long term. I'm like, no, I ain't. I'm not about to be on these medicine for a long time. <laughs> yeah. But I took it um, and they said that I was, it was a chemical imbalance. So mine was a stress brought on depression and they said that I had a chemical imbalance. So they are like your neurons and they aren't level. So what we're going to do is we're going to put you on a medication that will level you out to make you not have these symptoms mm-hmm. related to depression. And so I took it, I got level, and I feel like I'm in a good state of mind. I mean, and that's my story. I tell my clients all the time, I'm not embarrassed, I'm not ashamed that I went through that because that's my testimony. Like, that's something that I endured, and that's how I can really reach out to people because they want somebody, like, say, you're treating somebody or doing surgery on somebody and you've never done it before, or I take that back. That wasn't a good example, but you I mean, you know, I, I see what you're saying. Like if you yeah. had no experience in the area, but I'm trying to coach you through it and you're looking at exactly. me like, well, you're not qualified to even talk about it because you don't know what I've been through. Kind of like do rapping, you know what I'm saying? Like hearing him talk about it. Someone will listen to him before they would listen to some experts. Exactly. That don't have an issue. I've never had, because I think that could be an issue too. Like the person that's trying to help you never admits that they had an issue. And yeah, Exactly. I do feel that a lot of times you can't really get to a person. So if you're reaching out for help, you want somebody that's going to understand where you're coming from, Mm -hmm. not judge you and help you with your problems. And in my situation, I've been through it. I can explain to them what I experienced and their, their situation may be a lot different from mine, Mm -hmm. but because I've been at the bottom and have overcome it, they look at me as an inspiration. Like, you know, she was down and out. She mm-hmm. was going through this. And now she's here helping me try to go through my problems and they can relate to me. And that's how I build rapport with my clients because I do have a story and I've been through it. And I'm not judging them because everybody goes through something. It's yeah. just a lot of people don't want to admit that they've been there. Yeah. So so when we talked about earlier, when you said you didn't want to admit that, you know, that you had a weakness or something was going on. So how does that relate or what's the correlation between that and being raised like that? Because sometimes you can raise somebody where stop all that crying or there's nothing wrong with you or someone wants to talk like a child wants to talk. Because I remember being coming up around my uncles and you you couldn't cry, like you couldn't say what was wrong. And I think that causes you to internalize. So how does internalizing something lead to mental health type of issues? You have to have a release, whether it's crying, whether it's talking to somebody. I mean, like you have to get it out. And when you bottle up emotions, that's when you turn to other things to try to help you cope. But you're not having a way to release. You have to release those emotions. You got to cry. You got to scream. I mean, do whatever it takes Mm -hmm. to get it off of you. I mean, I've had some people that cut. That was their way of releasing. And I I mean, you know, that's not my way of doing things. And I wouldn't recommend somebody turn to something like that because you're hurting yourself. Yeah. But that's the only way that they felt that they could get some type of relief from the feelings that they were feeling. But there are other ways. And that's why seeking help from a mental health professional or I mean, there's places in this area, Piedmont Psychiatric Center, Horizon Behavioral Health, I mean, Virginia Baptist, like all of these mm-hmm. mental health services that are offered can help you. I mean, and a lot of times people feel like, and I've witnessed this too, if you're not admitting that you're at risk of harming yourself or anyone else, they may not accept or have you admit it, but that doesn't mean you stop there. You could go to Horizon, for instance. I mean, you don't have to be admitted into the hospital in order to seek help. 
But when you feel like that door is kind of closed in your face, like I'm coming to you for help and you're mm-hmm. turning me away. Yeah. That's not the end of the Probably road for you. Probably can make it worse. Yeah. And a lot of people, they give up. And when you're in a bad headspace, like you always feel like bad things are happening to yeah. you. You, this is just another thing that's going on, like mm-hmm. another door being slammed in my face. So now I have nowhere else to turn, but there are other options out there. And that's what people fail to realize. I mean, you go to the hospital, they say, no, we're not going to admit you because you're not psychotic or you're not at risk of harming yourself mm-hmm. or that kind of thing. But you could go to another mental health provider and seek regular service and be seen on a monthly basis and not have to do in home or yeah hospitalization kind of thing yeah so what is your advice to somebody that's, that keeps slipping through that loophole because you see tragedies on tv and when they do like the investigation this person was seeking help something wasn't right and, and and like you said due to the loophole they kept getting turned away so what is your advice for somebody that could be listening now that may feel like look man i'm about to do whatever because no one will listen to me a lot of times i would say family could make a huge impact. I mean, you know your family better than anybody and you could see a difference in your family. Mm -hmm. It's not just up to the mental health providers to solve all of the problems. I mean, you have to have that emotional support in the home as well. Noticing a change in them like, yo, you not feeling yourself today or I see you got something going on. Try to talk to them to pull it out of them. Mm -hmm. People don't come to me and say, hey, um, suicidal, um, having thoughts of doing something to myself, um, thinking, or I'm manic, I'm hearing voices, I'm seeing things, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. You have to pry that information out of people. Yeah. Ask the right questions, ask different questions. If they say, if you say, are you experiencing any symptoms related to your diagnosis or have you had any symptoms, that kind of thing. And they say, no, everything's fine. Mm-hmm reword the question yeah so have you been feeling irritable lately or have you been crying or when you're sitting in your room do you hear things that nobody else hears or more subtle do you find yourself talking to yourself like make a conversation with them and that's how you get the information it's not just saying are you having mental health symptoms or just just leaving it at that and taking that word for it because somebody that's going through mental illness is not gonna just open up to you and tell you everything that's going on. You have to pry that information and the family can do it the best. Yeah. Family members can really get you to open up and relate to you. Say, I mean, you know, just sit and have a conversation with you like, yo, what's been going on today? Mm -hmm. How you been feeling? You know, man, I had a bad day at work today. They may open up and say, you know what, bro? I had a messed up day too. Yeah. And the conversation will get started or you see them sitting over there. They ain't been eating. Like, yo, sit down at the table, have some food. Just try to engage with them. And it's in the home, too. It's not just up to the mental health providers. You got to build a bridge. Exactly. And the support. No, People just want to be supported. And when they feel like they have nowhere to turn, no one to talk to, no one that's on their level, that's when they reach drastic measures and do things that is the end all. Yeah, because they have nobody that they feel is in their corner and you need the support from family, friends, mental health providers. I mean, as far as mental health providers, they could seek med- I mean, provide medications. They could do the regular monitoring. They could link you to resources, that kind of thing. But then you go home. Nobody's there. You're lonely. None of your family's checking up on you. You feel like you're all alone. You need mm-hmm. that support when you're going through mental health issues. So kind of touch on the difference between a mental health professional versus like a friend. Because I think people confide in the wrong people. And friends and family aren't bound by HIPAA or whatever the confidentiality clause is. And I think some people may tell the wrong people. And then they tell other people. And then it's like, well, I'm not talking to anybody else. So how could you break that down so people would feel comfortable just to break down like how the confidentiality works? As far as being a mental health professional? Well, yeah, like when a, they, yeah, like when they come to a mental health professional, like how it benefits them. So being, as far as coming to any mental health facility, I mean, you're not able to disclose any information that they don't want disclosed unless they sign a release, which is a PHI, release of information. So if they sign that release and say, hey, 
if my mother call, you can let her know what my diagnosis is, what I've been going through, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. But if you say, I don't want you talking to Tom, my uncle, my brother, my sister, my cousin, we have no authority to give out any information unless you are at risk of harming yourself or someone else. And then at that time we become mandated reporters. Even if you say, I've, I'm just tired. Like, I just feel like I want to give up. Sometimes I feel like I want to go to sleep and not wake up. You're not necessarily labeled as suicidal. Mm -hmm. You're just not wanting to exist. You want to cease to exist, but you're not, you don't have a plan to do anything to yourself. You're not saying, oh, well, I plan to put a knife in my arm or slit my wrist or that kind of thing. So it's nothing that I could do if you come to me and say, hey, I just, there are times where I feel like I just want to give up. I just want to go to sleep and not wake up. Well, let me see what I can do that could help you feel better about your day or making you want to continue to go Mm -hmm. on. I wouldn't have to report something like that. And that's what people fail to realize. They don't open up because they're scared. If I say this, then you're going to have me hospitalized or yeah. you're going to have the cops coming to pick me up at my house. That's not the case. Like forcing treatment or something. Exactly. You have to voluntarily go unless you're manic, where you're not taking your medications, you're um, in a psychosis that kind of thing. And that's when the officers or mental health professionals will come into play and mandate that you seek help, which is through an ECO emergency custody order or temporary detention order. That's when those things come into place. But for you to just to come and seek help and say, Hey, I mean, you know, there's times where I'm just not wanting to function, not wanting to get out of bed. That's not really being suicidal. And that's where people, that's why people don't open up. They feel like, If I say this, this is what's going to happen to me. So they don't really get the help that they need. And Mm -hmm. that's when it can be prevented. Like that's when people, you could catch it before it gets to that point. I've been having these thoughts regularly, but I can't tell anybody because they're going to put me in the hospital. Well, then you do get to that point where you come up with the plan and you're like, I'm just tired of this every day. Same thing, same thing. And then you do drastic things. You take drastic measures into your own hands or you self-medicate become out of it yeah and then the end all so so before you go into your agenda now you said that like the self-medicate do you think there's a correlation between that and the addiction of pills now i definitely do i think that um people take pills because or like pain medications Mm -hmm. for instance I run across a lot of people that are into pain meds and it's because it relaxes them it puts them at ease they feel numb they don't have to really deal with their day to day or the pains that they go through. That medication is helping them cope. And then it becomes an addiction because they continue to use it. They continue to want that same feeling and Mm -hmm. then they get addicted to the medications. And that's when they, when they can't get the meds, when the doctors put the regulations and they're like, no, we can't give you the meds anymore. Then you're going to seek something harder, cocaine, crack, heroin, Mm. I think it starts with pain meds, honestly. Yeah, because I think it's a big misconception because a lot of people link pain meds, like getting addicted to, you know, being introduced to taking them for like a pain type of issue. But like you said, if you're wanting to get away mentally, what better way is to just take something to sleep all day? Yep. Or take some type of level two over-the-counter drug or, you know, like a hydrocodone, a lower tab, oxycontin, and you just get numb for a while. Yeah. And I, because I think it's 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 a big thing now with um with the prescription drugs, but I don't think anybody's relating the mental health issues with that. Because you always hear stories of hey yeah I got in an accident I was taking this from my back and I got addicted versus I have a mental health issue. You know what I mean? Well, even with the say you're in a car accident, you break your leg, you're bound to a wheelchair on crutches you have to ask other people to help you you used to be an independent person could Mm -hmm. do this on your own and now you have to reach out to help or reach out to people for help that hits your pride hard when you have to rely on others to do for you so now you have the injury you feel worthless because you're 
unable to do what you used to do. Mm -hmm. Then you become depressed. You're taking these pain meds to help with the pain in your leg and realize, hey, it's numbing me too. I don't feel so worthless or Mm -hmm. so unable to do. Like I'm just chilling. I'm in my zone, ain't bothering nobody, that kind of thing. And then you get hooked on the drugs that way. I mean, it's it's so many different avenues yeah. like that it could lead to, but you don't realize what a person goes through and mm-hmm. just having somebody that understands where they're coming from or listens to them. I mean, if you feel like you have nobody to talk to, I see a lot of times on Facebook, they're like, oh, well, such and such didn't reach out to me or I was going through this and nobody, you know, yeah. tried to connect with me, but... We don't, I mean, you know, we don't know what you're going through, Yeah. but if somebody just says, Hey, you know, like, yo, I saw you posted this or whatever. They're crying for help. Yeah. You just have to be that person that's going to help them and not run the information. So like when you were asking about as a mental health professional and as a friend, if the right friend reaches out to you and asks you for help, I mean, if you don't usually communicate with this person and y'all don't have a real relationship, Mm -hmm. them crying out for help, you reaching out to them is not necessarily going to open them up because they may not trust you. Yep, Yep. It has to be somebody that they know will keep their information. Won't run it, run them through the ground. Cause a lot Mm -hmm. of times you feel like, Oh, you just being nosy. And I know I see on there, if I was crying for help, I'm not the type to post it on Facebook, but if I was crying for help and somebody I haven't spoke to in two years, hit me up like, yo, what you got going? I'm like, Mm -hmm. fuck you (laughs) just being nosy, you know, coincidentally. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it has to be the right person. And I mean, it could be anybody that reaches out, but I feel like they're not just going to open up to anybody. So if you see a close friend or relative mm-hmm. crying out for help, just hit them up. Like, you yeah. know, just, you, know, you want to talk. Them. I mean, not even being asking for too much information. Like yeah. I saw your post the other day. I just wanted to see if you needed anything. Yeah. Just something just, just, just to let them know that, that that you noticed something and you're thinking about them. Exactly. Not like, yo, I seen that post you put on Facebook the other day. Like you you know, crying. what you got going on? Like, yeah. I, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, you know, yeah. you're divorcing. What, what's going on? Because so, I got a friend um, I met. His name is Willie Sanders, and he does, like, motivational speaking. Mm-hmm. And he said he just got, got through Facebook and was just sending these videos to random people. There's random people on his friends list. You're saying, hey, man, have a good day today. You know, here's some encouragement. He said people would inbox him back and say, man, you really don't know how much I needed to hear that. You really don't know what I'm going through. Yeah. And and he said something that simple made their day, not money, not a material item, but just that somebody reached out and said, hey, be encouraged. Yeah. You know what I mean? That means a lot to a lot of people because, I mean, you would... You couldn't believe the lack of support that families have. I mean, they may look like they're doing so good on the outside, (laughs) but on the inside, internally, they they feel lonely. They have no one. Yeah. Yeah, everything's superficial. Exactly. So. Yeah. And I think that that leads to before we get then we'll get into your um uh, agenda. But I think with social media, and we live this superficial lifestyle, is people are becoming depressed. Off of somebody's highlight reel. So if you look at the amount of time it takes to take a picture, think about it. It's like a couple of milliseconds. So me and my wife could be on the brink of divorce, but we just come together and take a picture and smile. And somebody else scrolls down and say, oh, man, I wish I could have what they exactly. got. Yep. <laughs> Not even realizing, yo, like, our joints tore up. Or your house is a filthy mess, but you got this one corner where you do your selfies. And someone sees that and they become depressed. It's people that just walk to parking lots and take pictures in front of nice cars and they post it and somebody sees that and they want that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so how can you touch on like the effects of social media or like what I'm trying to to say through that? You know what I mean? Because you see that a lot. Like people are depressed, like young kids are depressed because they don't have certain clothes or they don't have. And it's not really a big issue. It's just this is the, the world that we live in. Well, I'm I'm gonna say something, but it ain't really touching on what you're talking uh-huh. about. 
But when you say a millisecond to take a picture, it do take a millisecond, but the time it take you to prep oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah, pose it, yeah. for that picture, like you got to get, and you done took 20 of them, and you're you going to pick the best picture out of there. Yeah. It's not real life. But I think somebody that's suffering with mental illness shouldn't necessarily turn to Facebook yeah. because it's, it's going to be. But it's hard though, because I think you can. You could have a situation and just be scrolling, you know, and you'll see something that like, for example, like so society will put an age on everything. Well, you should be this by your 30. You should be this by your 36. And I think when you bow down to that pressure, you do sometimes evaluate your, your, yourself and say, man, like, why am I not at this point? Why am I not? So I think part of like the whole depression thing is freeing yourself from opinion. Yeah. Because sometimes even in families, like you might be the, the conservative one in your family. And because everybody else is like materialistic, then you feel some type of way because it's like, I'm I'm just not into that. So, but you still feel like. Uh, obligated. Yeah. Yeah. You still feel obligated because you don't want to be left out. But Trying at the same time. Trying to keep up time, with the Joneses. Yeah. Yeah. And I think <laughs> a lot of people, man, like they suffer and it affects other aspects of their life. Like here you are keeping up and looking good, but you ain't got nothing to eat. Yeah. And then that leads to another problem because really, you know, the truth, you know what I'm saying? So now you're getting depressed because you're trying to keep up with all these different phases. You know, if, if, if I'm here, then I can't be there. You know what I mean? And I think as far as parents, um, like I said, some people don't, they don't free themselves of other people's opinions. Some people do the best they can. They work two and three jobs. They provide for their kids. They provide for themselves. But sometimes in other people's um, eyes, that's not enough. And because you succumb to that pressure, now you're depressed. But really, like, you're in a better position than they are. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? They're putting on a facade and you're living in real life. But this lady, she made a comment to me. She was like, well, I was told by whoever your income should be your age. So when I get 50, I'm supposed to be making 50000 a year. If I go by that. I'm a yeah. You gonna work yourself fail to myself. Death. Yeah, you gonna work yourself. I to mean, death. I would love to be there, mm-hmm. and I hope, like the devil, I'm gonna be there yeah. <laughs> when I hit that fifty. <laughs> but I mean, if you put that extra pressure, pressure on man. yourself, yeah, it's like because I don't really get into like um like stigmatisms, what society says. Say like, if God bless my wife with a job, but she making more than me, it's not gonna bother me. But to some people, that's that's enough to throw them over the edge and mess yeah. up their marriage, and then for them to feel like they're 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 not worth anything, and they could be making sixty thousand, but because I'm not doing what old boy next door is doing, you're not doing good enough. Exactly. Yeah. Or I'm not driving this, and I think like the pressure, man, like especially with kids, and you see it like you know with the bullying, social media, close. You got parents now. I've heard parents actually say, well. But I got to get them these two hundred dollars shoes because if I don't, they're gonna get picked on. Oh, uh, <laughs> smell to the gnaw. <laughs> that's, that's not my cup uh-huh. of tea. Like, I mean, I don't want my kids to be picked on. Um, I don't want them to feel less than anyone else. But I send my kids to school with nice clothes every mm-hmm. year. I bust my tail to make sure I buy them new clothes. And it's not about new clothes, but kids are so cruel these days. So you have to try to protect your child all at the same, but that shouldn't even matter. And a lot of people compare their situation to someone else. It can be a good thing if you're trying to motivate yourself to do better. Mm -hmm. But if you're comparing yourself to someone and saying, I'm not doing good enough, I mean, just say, I see them on there. That's going to be me next mm-hmm. year. Set goals for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Strive to get there instead of making it a negative thing and beating up on yourself. And yeah, you can it'll, only. It'll mess you up. Yeah. And you can only compare yeah. yourself to your to you. Yeah. Because I remember when I started my podcast and I was like episode 10. And I had a friend from Richmond who was like episode three. Within like a month, it was like episode 30 or something like that. And I was still on like going on 17. So I started to feel some 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 kind of way about that, but not realizing that we're different. Different topics, different subjects. We're different people. Exactly. You and know what you're I'm saying? better 
now than you were then. So Mm -hmm. by you doing these different podcasts, different videos, you're improving Mm -hmm. each time you do one. That's you comparing yourself to you. I'm Mm -hmm. doing a lot better than I was doing a month ago or whatever the case may be. And that's how I look at my life. Yeah. I look at where I've come from, which I didn't, I'm not going to sit here in front like, oh, Mm -hmm. I struggled all my life and we had no food and had to figure out what we was going to do kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I know the struggle. Like mm-hmm. I mean, my mom busted her tail to make sure we had food to eat. That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. She was a provider. Yeah. I compare my situation from where I came from and where I am now. I always strive to do better than I was doing mm-hmm. a year ago, two years ago. That's my motivation. And I set goals for myself to prevent myself from getting yep. depressed. Like, oh my God, I feel like I should be doing this or I feel like I should be yeah. doing that. I set small goals. I reach that goal. Oh girl, you doing good. Pat on your back. Like yeah. keep going, you know, mm-hmm. and I motivate myself. I don't compare myself to other people. Like sometimes I sit on there, I'd be like, dang, I wish that was me. Wish I had whatever. I wish mm-hmm. I could hit the number. I mean, we all have things that we want or mm-hmm. we wish we could have, but Unless you set goals for yourself to strive to get there, it's not going to do you any good to want what the next man got if you're not putting in the work to get you there. Right. Because a lot of people want it. They don't want to, they don't want what comes along with it. Yeah. And I'm lazy. I'm going to be the (laughs) first to admit lazy. I, I mean, I'm a procrastinator, but I'm proud of my accomplishments Mm -hmm. that I mean, who would have thought I would have went to school when I graduated from high school. I don't want to see another school. Went to, decided after three kids i'm gonna go to college you know yeah. i can't get out this day i oh by the way people <laughs> i was in corrections wanted to get out of uniform mm-hmm. and the only way i could get out of uniform was by pushing myself to earn my degree so that's what i did but you have to figure out where you want to go in life mm-hmm. and figure out what you got to do to get there yeah. and that's what i did um but we went Way off. That's all good. All right. Let's <laughs> now let's now let's go into your agenda. I mean, because all that plays a part into I think mental health. Because the whole like comparison and and the Me Too movement, not like the woman Me Too, but I got a nice car. Well, Me Too. I you know I need one. And I think that plays a part into it. Um. Yeah. So we'll go into your uh, uh agenda, and that way we can you know we can stay on track. You know your your bullet points since you're the subject matter expert. You know what I'm saying? Glad glad to have you on. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just something I really enjoy doing. I love helping people, and I'm not just saying this for the people, mm-hmm. but I really do. I mean, because I feel like if you have a – it takes a special kind of person to work with a special kind of people. I'm not saying I'm better than anybody else, mm-hmm. but you got to have a niche for things. Yeah. And the mental health, I'm intrigued by it. I mean, another thing that I'm intrigued by is sex offenders. I think that the things that they do are wrong, but what I want to do is figure out what triggers them. You can't treat somebody who's a sex offender. Mm -hmm. I consider that to be a mental illness. Like when you are attracted to um, a certain age. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've heard people say, I mean, through the criminal justice system, I've heard individuals have to explain what drives them, what turns them on. It's the ages. They have an age group between seven and 12, Mm -hmm. the smell of their hair, the touch of their skin. That's what turns them on. Uh That's just like you loving high yellow women, Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) a certain size. I mean, that's your preference. Yeah. That's their preference. But you want to figure out why you wired like that. Like what makes you what tick to feel like that. Exactly. And I feel like they're stuck at a certain age. Something traumatic yeah. happened in their lives. And I well, don't. Well, there's no way to, to um, I think it's hard to treat a problem when you don't know the root cause. Exactly. That's what I would love to figure out. And like um, when I was dealing with sex offenders, that was, I was, I listened to some of the stories and I mm-hmm. was disgusted by some of the things that was said because they had to openly admit mm-hmm. to certain things. And I'm like, I can't do this. Like I have kids, I have daughters. I mean, I have a son. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I can't, I want to jump across this table is yeah. my thought process. 
And a girl came to me and she was like, you know, you can't treat a sex offender. They're always going to have those thoughts. You have to learn what their triggers are, how to prevent them from actually reoffending. Mm-hmm. That's what the importance of you will be. And that's when my light bulb kind of came on. It's like, you know, they're always going to have this desire to do it. Just mm-hmm. like I may be attracted to dark skinned men, tall, slim, you know, whatever mm-hmm. the case, whatever your preference is. Yeah. You're always going to prefer that type of person because that's what does it for you. Yeah. That's what does it for them. Yeah. You have to figure out as a professional what drives them to want to do these things and mm-hmm. how can I prevent them? What can I show that for them to have less desire to do yeah. it, um, maybe get a magazine or, I mean, yeah. you know, whatever to try to figure out how to stop them from wanting to do these mm-hmm. things or to just remove things from them that triggers them to want yeah. to do it, you know? Yeah. So I've always been intrigued by that as well as the mental illness like yeah. what triggers them how to catch them when they're in crisis how to catch them before they get too far and that's a hard thing to tackle like yeah everybody's so different you never know when that person's at that point where they want to just end it all mm-hmm. and that's why it's important for you to have regular contact with the client so you can know I've been seeing them for six months and I've noticed it may be just the most minute change in Um, them, but it's something significant for you because that's not their baseline. Like that's not what you're used to seeing from Mm -hmm. them. And that by you noticing that, like, you know, she really does care. She's really paying attention to me. She's really trying to help me. And you highlight and Hey, I mean, you know, I noticed that you've, changed a little bit like uh-huh. you know tell me what's going on yeah for to catch them before they get too far and i mean just the least little bit of encouragement or just acknowledgement means a lot to some people like you think i want to because somebody boasts you about oh you got a nice house you got a nice car you got this you got that that's something big for you because these are your accomplishments but some people haven't accomplished as much as you have accomplished so if you just acknowledge the things that they are currently doing Mm -hmm. is motivation for them. Or you acknowledging that they're not as worthless as they may seem or somebody really does care about me. I mean, you know, you got family to support Mm -hmm. you and care about you. Some people don't have that. If that one person in that position is able to say, you know, I'm really trying to help you. All I want to do is help you. I'm not trying to. And a lot of times I run across people that say, you just want to lock me up. What good is locking you up going <laughs> to yeah. do for me? Yeah. Like You're not going to get treated. Exactly. And if you go, you're going to get there, do what you need to do in order to get out, to go back to doing what you were doing before. We have to figure out what's causing you to get there Try to prevent to it. Prevent it. Mm-hmm. And then treat keep you on that same level so you don't get back to that point. And that's what the importance of someone in the mental health field is. It's to prevent hospitalizations. We don't want you to go to the hospital. We want to keep you in the community, mm-hmm. keep you out in society by giving you the treatment that you need. If it's a counselor or a therapist or psychiatrist, like not everybody needs medication yeah. for their mental health. They may just need somebody to talk to. I just, I mean, you know, somebody who went through a divorce. You may not be have been depressed, but because you went through something traumatic, yeah. now you're in a depression state. Going to a therapist, talking to somebody, being able to release, let them know what's going on, what you've been going through so they can help you cope with your current situation. And then you can overcome it and be done. And you may be on top of the world after you're done with that, moving on to the next man kind of thing or wife. But... It's not all about medication, hospitalizations. It's all about whatever your needs are as an individual. And that's what mental health professionals are supposed to be able to No, be able to yeah, tell you. Yeah, kind of be that outlet. Yeah. This is the, we don't tell you what you need, you tell us what you need. Yeah. What you feel like you have going on will give you recommendations. It's up to you to say, "Hey, this is 
this is what I need. I need to talk to somebody. Like yeah. I'm going through it. So I think most times that's what people need. Like um the the young man that just killed himself um around this area. I think um uh, I was working out with a guy that knew him and he was like he seen his last Snapchat post and he was like, I'm gonna just chill and stay to myself and lay low. Y'all pray for me. And he said he didn't think anything of it. But that was like one of the signs that he was, yeah, like you said, trying to cry for help, but everybody does it in their own way. Exactly. And not everybody's going to blatantly say, you know, I'm thinking about taking my life. You have to be able to notice the change Mm -hmm. in that person. And a lot of times, you know, family can notice a change. If you're seeing a psychiatrist or seeing a mental health case manager or counselor or whatever the case may be, by having that regular monitoring, seeing them once Mm -hmm. a month, they can notice a change in you and be able to catch it before it gets too far. So, I mean, and like I said, you don't necessarily have to be on medications or anything, but just having that regular person that has regular contact with you. If you go... Like accountability co- partner almost. Yeah, but if you go fall off the face of the earth for a couple of months, somebody's going to notice it. And if you don't have that support outside and you need help elsewhere, mental health professional, seek that help with them. They can notice when... You've gone missing for a little bit. A lot of people feel lonely. Yeah. Don't have support. Some people do stuff on purpose. Like, I've seen people do that or just shy away for a while. And the first thing they say was, nobody called me. You know what I'm saying? And they'll know, like, they'll, like, that's their way, I think, of confirming what they feel. Because I've seen family members just kind of lay low for a while. And as soon as you see them, well, ain't nobody called me. Or you, you know, well, you want that concern or you want that. You know what I'm saying? And I've seen people do that. And I think... That's one of the ways they want to confirm to themselves: is this thought true? You know, like they 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 might have the thought. I wouldn't say voices, so to speak, but you may feel in your heart, no one cares about me. You know what I'm saying? No one wants me around, and so people that do that sometimes just to confirm what their thought process yeah. already is. It's like yeah, it's like you, you're looking for confirmation. Kind of thing. Yeah, you're yeah. looking for confirmation. Not saying that. What they're doing is right. Because some people like that I know that do that, they just lay low all the time. They don't want to be bothered. And so I think people tend to stay away and kind of let them do their thing. But I think there's a small group of people that really feel like, because no one pays them any attention, no one ever has time for them. They really feel in their heart, nobody wants me around. And when they do little things like that, you know, like you said, fall off the face of the earth for a couple months and no one calls, or they see them, it's like, hmm. Hey, what's up? Yeah. And a lot of times people think they're crying wolf. Like they keep, Mm -hmm. every time I turn around, you going through something. And a lot of times family are the worst critics. The worst ones, yeah. See, being around your family, like, boy, shut up and stop crying. Like you all, every time I see you, you always crying. But that's their way of releasing. Mm -hmm. They're getting it out of them. But by you shutting them down, Mm -hmm. saying, shut up and stop that crying, you'll cry, baby. Every time I turn around, you're crying. Then you're internalizing it. shutting them out, too. Yeah. They don't want to open up to you. You're internalizing your feelings. Mm -hmm. And then you become your worst enemy. Yeah. Because I remember when I was going through with my stepdad, I remember um, this feeling you get. It's almost like going through the tunnel. You know, you can see light on the other end. It's like going through and you get to the point where it's like you're so in halfway that you can't see light on either side. You feel stuck. And I remember like, yo, when will this ever end? And you begin to adapt. The dysfunctional behavior is normal. Because after a while, you just get numb to it. Like, But you just still feel in the inside like you in a crowd, but there's no tears. There's no, you just feel like, you know what I'm saying? Because I got to that point where you just want to end it. Like, yo, like what is, what's the difference? Like. If I was here or not, like, I don't want to keep going through that. And I think it's tough when you get to that point, because depending on what type of personality you have, you might be an internalizer. And I think that's dangerous when an internalizer gets to, gets to the point where they feel like it's, it's no way out, because that's already their personality. So no one's going to really catch a lot of the red flags. Because if you quiet, you you know, you lay low and, and stay to yourself, it's not out the ordinary. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think that's dangerous, because I could be like, and I could hide it. You know what I'm saying? You think everything cool. I smile or whatever just so you wouldn't even get in my business. But I was internalized. I, ma- I mastered how to internalize my issues just so I could make it home or get away from people. You know what yeah. I mean? And I think that's one of the dangerous combinations because in your eyes, 
Oh, that's just how they were. You know, they was always quieter. They yeah. not realizing, yo, they was at the tipping point a while ago. But you as an individual has to know what works for you. What what helps me feel better that's not substances or, you mm-hmm. know, self injurious behavior kind of thing. Yeah. But what do you like to do? So say you're into knitting or crocheting or coloring or drawing or whatever. I mean, something to get you in a better headspace so you're not always in a negative thought process. Do something positive. Like, um, I had a girl tell me that painting, like they're in a dark place now. Painting is what helps them get in a happier Mm -hmm. place. You need to find your happy place and try to keep yourself there versus always being in this negative down in the dump space. So I love talking because it's like a release. Oh, yeah. We know you love to talk. (laughs) Yeah. Like even this, like the podcast, right? What I realize is um, like the ones that I do by myself, even if I do it with people, it's allowing me to express some type of... uh, some type of feeling. It's like going to the restroom or going to the gym. You know, when you go to the gym, you're releasing a lot of internal uh, stress and trigger points in your muscles. When you go to the restroom, you know what I'm saying? Like you're passing waste. You know what I'm saying? Like when yeah, you, like, we- you know, like I might be feeling that way <laughs> in just a few. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I think some people, I think the worst feeling in the world is wanting to talk to somebody and the expectation for that person is high and they don't want to hear you. You feel what I'm saying? Like if you like if you got a circle of people and um out of this circle of people, this set of people should be if if not, this should be the one or these should be the people that should listen to you. But they won't listen. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think some people like they 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 could have uh, 999 people that would listen to them, but because the one don't want to listen, that matters it crushes the their day. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like they just want to be heard by this person. And it could be, like I said, a world full of people waiting to listen because this person was not listening. It crushes them. Like, I've seen kids do that. Mommy's there. You know, uncles and aunts are there. You know what I'm saying? But because one person, whether the mom will listen to them or the dad or their favorite uncle. You know what I'm saying? The like most or, or their person sister. in their yeah, life. Yeah, and I've seen that, like, crush, like, literally crush people where they develop social issues. You know what I mean? Because they feel like, from that point, they internalize it. They don't talk about it, and it converts into, like, I'm not worthy, I'm not wanted. Yeah, you know I mean, I used to feel like that about my about my dad because he he raised my sister. You know what I'm saying? So my eyes, as a child, you know, I didn't know the difference between you got a situation and, you know, my mom's not with you anymore. I'm just thinking you just made your choice. You know what I'm saying? So I think when you're not, I think lack of education, like ignorance can be, I think ignorance along with, like, emotion can be dangerous. Yeah, I would agree. Because you just start to piece stuff together. And before you know it, you've come to your own type of um, conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> and you built this world in your head like, oh, this is... You know what I'm saying? Like, you created a new reality. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And sometimes it ain't even like that. Like, somebody could, like, not be speaking to you because they dealing with something. You know what I'm saying? And then, like, you feel crazy when they like, yo, uh, I ain't really called or nothing. This is what I've been dealing with. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I think that it's all about your perspective. Hey, this is your boy Teflon John. That was part one of the powerful two-part series, The Stigma of Mental Illness. Stay tuned to next week. Next week, part two will be dropping. Please share this episode with people that need to hear it because mental illness is truly a global issue. You know what I'm saying? Everybody knows someone that is being impacted, you know what I'm saying, or feeling it from mental illness. And so my... my um. My homework for you is just share this episode with as many people as you can. Stay tuned next week, part two. One love. Be blessed. We would like to thank you for listening to this episode of The Art of Reinvention by Teflon John. And we encourage you to share this episode across all your social media platforms. And we also encourage you to visit our website at www.imteflonjohn.com and follow us on all our social media platforms at facebook.com slash realteflonjohn, twitter.com slash realteflonjohn, and instagram.com slash realteflonjohn. And while you're on Facebook, go ahead and like our page so you can receive firsthand notifications every time we go live with the motivational video or any motivational content. And as I always say, One love, be blessed.